number eight of london ancient and modern this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two london from the medical point of view part five the royal society gresham college the earliest hospitals the royal hospitals early hospital practice the royal society in considering the growth of medical knowledge in london we should do very wrong to omit mentioning the royal society in the establishment of which charles the second seemed to have taken a lively interest the first informal meetings of those who afterwards formed the nucleus of this important society were held at wadham college oxford and after the restoration at gresham college london among those mentioned by chamberlain as the founders are robert boyle sir w petty the bishop of salisbury the dean of wells dr wallace dr goddard dr willis sir christopher wren lord bruckner john evelyn thomas henshaw sir george ent and dr croon the actual foundation of the royal society by charter from the king took place on april twenty second sixteen sixty three and amongst the powers granted to the society by their charter was that of taking and anatomizing the dead bodies of persons put to death by order of the law their recognized place of meeting was gresham college but after the fire they met for a time at arundel house in their discoursings we are told they lay aside all set speeches and eloquent harangues as fit to be banished out of all civil assemblies as a thing found by woeful experience especially in england fatal to peace and good manners and every one endeavours to express his opinion or desire in the plainest and most concise manner even at the present day there are not wanting those who sneer at the ologies and it is therefore not surprising that in sixteen eighty two it should have been necessary to meet criticism by putting forward a defence of this society but what advantage and benefit says chamberlain appears after so many meetings it is true they have made many experiments of light as the excellent lord bacon calls them and perhaps not so many experiments of fruit and profit yet without doubt some may hereafter find out no small use and benefit even in those luciferous experiments which now seem only curious and delightful but it is also as true that the royal society hath made a great number of experiments and inventions very profitable and advantageous to mankind they have mightily improved the naval civil and military architecture they have advanced the art conduct and security of navigation they have not only put this kingdom upon planting woods groves orchards vineyards evergreens but also ireland scotland new england virginia jamaica barbados all our plantations begin to feel the influence of this society at gresham college they had a library the gift of the duke of norfolk and a repository or museum filled with natural curiosities gresham college this allusion to the royal society has brought to our notice gresham college the first home of the society pepys often alludes to the college meaning thereby the meeting of the royal society in gresham college this college which ought to have been the nucleus of a university of london was founded by sir thomas gresham who was born in fifteen nineteen and flourished in the reigns of edward the sixth mary and elizabeth he was himself a university man having been at keys college cambridge and he amassed great wealth as a merchant and financier he died in fifteen seventy nine and by his will he left the bulk of his property to his widow with the stipulation that at her death his house at bishopsgate street should be converted into a college and that it should have for its endowment the rents arising from the shops in the royal exchange which in gresham's time amounted to seven hundred pounds a year the corporation and the mercers company were the trustees of this fund there were seven endowed professorships viz astronomy physic law geometry divinity rhetoric and music 
gresham's house in bishopsgate street appears to have been admirably adapted for a college it was quadrangular and had a garden and planted walks so that the quiet and seclusion which are essential to study might have been obtained there be the cause what it may the college which escaped the fire did not flourish the royal society left it in seventeen ten and in seventeen sixty eight gresham house was pulled down to make way for an excise office the government granting five hundred pounds a year in exchange for the house and land after this date the lectures were given in a room of the royal exchange and in eighteen forty three the present gresham college was built at the corner of basinghall street the house being outwardly not to be distinguished from the mercantile houses which abound in the city the cause of the failure of gresham college is doubtful dr johnson was of the opinion that it was due to the fact that the students paid no fees and therefore a powerful stimulus to the professor was wanting the condition that the lectures were to be given in latin as well as english a condition reasonable enough in gresham's time has served as a clog but probably the chief cause is to be found in the physical and moral atmosphere of the city the corner of basinghall street is a very different place from those groves of the academy where plato taught the truth here every creature you meet appears to be in a hurry certainly in too great a hurry to get wisdom which says the son of sirach cometh by opportunities of leisure if universities in the proper sense have languished in london the same cannot be said of learned societies london the great exchange and mart of the world has assisted by its numerous and flourishing societies in the exchange of knowledge and ideas among learned men the medical society of london was founded in seventeen seventy three in bolt court fleet street the royal medico chirurgical society was founded in eighteen o five the other medical societies are all recent creations thus it appears that the college of physicians and the company of barbers and surgeons and also gresham college were the earliest schools of medicine in london the only places where anything approaching to systematic instruction was given the earliest hospitals it was scarcely before the beginning of the eighteenth century that the hospitals of london began to be of any importance in the teaching of medicine the earliest hospitals in london were leper hospitals for at one time leprosy abounded in this city st james's palace is built on the site of a hospital for maidens that were leprous the name of spitalfields reminds us that at one time there was a spittle here for lepers there were other hospitals of a similar kind in southwark and kingsland the next hospitals were mostly institutions founded by the religious houses and were very much of the nature of almshouses where the wretched unfortunate and diseased were received for a time the two most important of these were st bartholomew's hospital and st thomas's hospital and a few words as to their origin will not i think be uninteresting as regards st bartholomew's hospital mr morant baker has written a most interesting monograph entitled the two foundations to which i am indebted for much that i have to say under this head this hospital owes its origin to rahir who is said to have been a minstrel jester in the court of henry i concerning this pious founder an aged chronicler one of the monks of the priory of st bartholomew tells us man born and sprung of low kinnage and when he attained the flower of youth he began to haunt the households of noblemen and the palaces of princes where under every elbow of them he spread their cushions with japes and flatterings delectably anointing their eyes by this manner to draw to him their friendships and still he was not content with this but often haunted the king's palace henry the first and among the noiseful press of that tumultuous court informed himself with polity and cardinal suavity by that which he might draw to him the hearts of many a one 
it does not seem at all likely that rahir ever wore a cap and bells as a professional jester but that he was rather a persona grata about the court alike for his merry tongue and his handsome presence concerning which his effigy in the church of st bartholomew the great speaks clearly enough dr norman moore by reference to an early manuscript has clearly shown that rahir was no professional jester he was early in life a canon of st paul's and dr moore thinks that he was possibly famous for his wit just as sidney smith was famous his fashionable and giddy life seems to have told upon rahir and he ultimately turned serious and made a pilgrimage to rome fell ill there saw visions notably one of st bartholomew the apostle who commanded him to go home and build a church and asylum for the sick and weary in smithfield rahir's persuasive powers were effectual in obtaining a site in the king's market smithfield and the foundation of the church and hospital took place in eleven twenty three as to smithfield the monk's manuscript continues right unclean it was and as a marsh dungy and fenny with water almost every time abounding and that that was imminent above the water dry was deputed and ordained to the jubite or gallows of thieves and to the torment of other that were condemned by judicial authority rahir seems to have brought his histrionic talents to bear on his good work for the chronicler records that by feigning idiocy he attracted the reverence of the superstitious and drew to him the fellowship of children and servants assembling himself as one of them and with their use and help stones and other things profitable to the building lightly he gathered together it is needless to say that many miracles were performed in the early days of the priory and hospital of st bartholomew it was distinctly a monastic institution and more resembled as mr baker suggests the sick and lying in ward of a modern workhouse than a hospital as we understand the term mr baker further suggests that the jousts and tournaments of smithfield as well as the horse and cattle fair which had been held there from time immemorial may have provided the monks with not a few surgical casualties for the following facts concerning st thomas hospital i am indebted to a paper by mr rendell read in eighteen eighty two before the college society of literature those who have travelled from london bridge to cannon street by the railway must have noticed the fine church of st saviour's southwark this church marks the site of the ancient priory of st mary overy which was the original home of st thomas hospital southwark in ancient times was largely occupied by the clergy not far from the priory of st mary was the abbey of bermondsey and the palatial residence of the bishops of winchester and rochester in twelve o seven the priory of st mary was burnt down and with it the hospital of st mary at winchester house was living at that time peter de rupibus a bishop of winchester this prelate decided to rebuild the hospital in a better form and on a better site and accordingly set to work to obtain funds by means of the usual charter of indulgences addressed to the faithful in twelve twenty eight behold says bishop peter at southwark an ancient hospital built of old to entertain the poor has been entirely reduced to cinders and ashes by a lamentable fire moreover the place wherein the old hospital has been founded was less suitable less appropriate for entertainment and habitation both by reason of the straitness of the place and by reason of the lack of water and many other conveniences according to the advice of us and of wise men it is transferred and transplanted to another more commodious site where the air is more pure and calm and the supply of water more plentiful but whereas the building of the new hospital calls for many and manifold outlays and cannot be crowned with its due consummation without the aid of the faithful we request advise and earnestly exhort you all and with a view to the remission of your sins enjoin you according to your abilities 
from the goods bestowed on you by god to stretch forth the hand of pity to the building of this new hospital and out of your feelings of charity to receive the messengers of the same hospital coming to you for the needs of the poor to be therein entertained that for these and other works of piety you shall do you may after the course of this life reap the reward of eternal felicity from him who is the recompenser of all good deeds and the loving and compassionate god now we by the mercy of god and trusting in the merits of the glorious virgin mary and the apostles peter and paul and st thomas the martyr and st swithin to all the believers in christ who shall look with the eye of piety on the gifts of their alms that is to say having confessed contrite in heart and truly penitent we remit to such twenty days of the penance enjoined on them and grant it to them to share in the prayers and benefactions made in the church of winchester and other churches erected by the grace of the lord in the diocese of winchester ever in the lord farewell the prior of st mary overy assisted in the good work and several popes confirmed the acts of their subordinates and thus st thomas's hospital was founded on the site now occupied by part of the london bridge railway station a site which was its home from twelve twenty eight to eighteen sixty two in fifteen thirty five there were forty beds at st thomas hospital in fifteen o seven the hospital was enlarged and repaired the void ground called the faucon and afterwards the tennis place and crossbane probably connected with the game of skittles was acquired and the following was the bill paid to mr scott of kent and anne his wife for the land forty marks and for a gown cloth of damask for the said anne three pounds sixteen shillings eight pence in all thirty one pounds thirteen shillings four pence when the land or very nearly the same was sold to the southeastern railway company in eighteen sixty two it fetched two hundred and ninety six thousand pounds the total cost of land and buildings erected in fifteen o seven with the legal expenses was three hundred and eleven pounds six shillings one and a half pence about the year fifteen twenty seven james nicholson of st thomas spittal in southwark had a printing press within the precincts of the hospital and among other notable books produced the bible known as nicholson's coverdale the royal hospitals when the religious houses were suppressed by henry the eighth these hospitals and asylums which were part and parcel of them were suppressed also and for a time the poor found themselves deprived of much assistance to which they had become accustomed it was therefore found necessary to re-establish these institutions on a new footing this was done by henry the eighth and edward the sixth and when we speak of these monarchs as founders we must remember that they refounded in a better form that which henry had previously destroyed st bartholomew's was refounded in fifteen forty eight and st thomas's in fifteen fifty three and in fifteen fifty seven the four royal hospitals st bartholomew's st thomas's christ's hospital and bridewell were in a sense incorporated together for purposes of management dr payne has kindly permitted me to inspect a little book bearing the date fifteen fifty seven and entitled the order of the hospitals of king henry the eighth and king edward the sixth viz st bartholomew's christ's bridewell st thomas's by the mayor commonality and the citizens of london governors of the possessions revenues and goods of the said hospitals from this it appears that one hospital called st bartholomew's the little was founded by king henry the eighth and the other three by his successor the governors were to be sixty-six at least fourteen aldermen and fifty-two grave commoners whereof four were to be scriveners to the intent that in every house may be one or more two of the aldermen were governors-general one to be called controller and the other surveyor while the remaining sixty-four were divided equally among the four hospitals three aldermen and thirteen commoners to each whereof one was to be their treasurer 
the governors were appointed at a general court held on st matthew's day september twenty first and held office for two years from michaelmas day september twenty ninth on appointment a solemn charge was read to them in which the objects of the four hospitals were thus set forth idleness the enemy of all virtue is suppressed and banished the tender youth of the needy and idle beggars virtuously brought up the number of sick sore and miserable people refreshed harboured and cured of their maladies and the vile and sturdy strumpet compelled to labour and travail in profitable exercises the latter paragraph refers especially to bridewell which was originally established as a house of correction for the strumpet and idle person for the rioter that consumeth all and for the vagabond that will abide in no place bridewell has been rendered immortal by hogarth's fourth plate of the harlot's progress but as an institution it disappeared in eighteen sixty three among the officers of the royal hospitals were scrutiners who performed the duties of collectors of legacies and other gifts the charge to these officers concluded as follows and finally when you shall happen to be in the company of good virtuous and wealthy men you shall do the best and uttermost of your wits and powers advance commend and set forth the order of the said hospital and the notable commodities that ensue to the whole realm of england and chiefly to the city of london by erection of the same and also how faithfully and truly the goods given to their users are by the governors thereof ministered and bestowed they were also enjoined to exhort scriveners to remind testators of the hospital when making their wills and to provide the said scriveners with prospectuses for their information they were further enjoined to exhort the bishops and clergy and especially the preachers at paula's cross that they twice or thrice in the quarter at the least do move and exhort the people to further the said work the officers attached to each hospital were the clerk the matron the nurses and keepers of wards the steward the officer appointed to warn the collectors and church wardens the cook the butler the porter the shoemaker the chirurgian the barber the beadles another institution having similar origin to the royal hospitals is bethlehem hospital or bedlam this was founded by henry the eighth on the site of the suppressed priory of our lady of bethlehem at the end of the seventeenth century it was moved to a new building in moorfields and finally at the beginning of the present century it was established where it now is in st george's fields southwark early hospital practice we get an insight into the methods of practice in the london hospitals in the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries from a series of papers in the st bartholomew's hospital reports written by sir james paget dr church and dr norman moore in the eighteenth volume of st bartholomew's hospital reports dr norman moore gives some interesting facts with regard to the first medical officer thomas vickery who was appointed somewhere near the year fifteen fifty he lived in the hospital wore a smart livery which cost fifty-three shillings was sergeant surgeon to henry the eighth and his three successors and wrote a book on anatomy thomas vickery is represented in holbein's picture of henry the eighth granting a charter to the barber surgeons he appears to have served abroad with the army and to have been a person of considerable experience and to have had a proper sense of his duty as a professional man and a citizen not so much is to be said for the first physician to st bartholomew's dr lopez a portuguese jew appointed in fifteen sixty one whose main object in this world appears to have been to get money he was convicted of conspiring with the spaniards to compass queen elizabeth's death by poison and in fifteen ninety four was hanged at tyburn dr norman moore gives another graphic picture of an elizabethan surgeon in william close a man who was an army surgeon attached to the earl of leicester and who in the intervals of foreign service was attached to st bartholomew's 
close appears to have been a man of learning and experience devoted to his art and well able to do battle with irregular practitioners of these encounters he doubtless had many and he gives a lively description of an interview with a quack vendor of a balm and plaster then riseth out of his chair flaring and garing this miraculous surgeon gloriously glittering like a man in the moon with his bracelets about his arms therein many precious jewels and stones of st vincent his rocks his fingers full of rings a silver case with instruments hanging at his girdle and a gilt spatula sticking in his hat with a rose and crown fixed on the same close was surgeon to christ's hospital and we learn the interesting fact that in his day twenty or thirty children had the scurvy at a time a fact due to a diet largely composed of fish and other salted provisions with a scanty allowance of vegetables and a total absence of potatoes sir james paget in an interesting paper written in eighteen forty six while he was filling the offices of warden to st bartholomew's and lecturer on physiology entitled records of harvey gives us some facts regarding this very great man which help us to understand london hospital practice as carried on during the reigns of james i and charles i harvey was appointed physician to the hospital in sixteen o nine seven years after taking his degree at padua and seven years before he imparted his great discovery of the circulation to the college of physicians he was appointed during the lifetime of his predecessor dr wilkinson and was to succeed on the death or retirement of the latter and like candidates for hospital appointments of the present day he came furnished with testimonials one from the king and another from the president of the college of physicians and it is almost needless to say that his application was granted on his appointment after the death of dr wilkinson the following charge was read to him physician you are here elected and admitted to be the physician of the poor of this hospital to perform the charge following that is to say one day at the least through the year or oftener as need shall require you shall come to this hospital and cause the hospitaller matron or porter to call before you in the hall of this hospital such and so many of the poor harboured in this hospital as shall need the counsel and advice of the physician and you are here required and desired by us in god his most holy name that you endeavour yourself to use the best of your knowledge in the profession of physic to the poor then present or any other of the poor at any time of the week which shall be sent home unto you by the hospitaller or matron for your counsel writing in a book appointed for that purpose such medicines with their compounds and necessaries as appertaineth to the apothecary of this house to be provided and made ready for to be administered unto the poor every one in particular according to his disease you shall not for favour lucre or gain appoint or write anything for the poor but such good and wholesome things as you shall think with your best advice will do the poor good without any affection or respect to be had to the apothecary and you shall not take gift or reward of any of the poor of this house for your counsel in sixteen twenty six harvey's stipend which had been twenty five pounds per annum was raised to thirty three pounds six shillings eight pence on condition that he relinquished his claim to one of the hospital houses in sixteen thirty he obtained leave of absence from his hospital duties having been commanded by the king to travel with james stuart duke of lennox harvey was at this time physician extraordinary to the king and in the year following was appointed physician in ordinary dr andrews appears to have been appointed as harvey's substitute during his absence the governors showing themselves somewhat unwilling to accept dr smith who was harvey's nominee it appears that the work of the hospital increasing and harvey being much occupied at court 
dr andrews was definitely appointed harvey's coadjutor or as we should say assistant physician with a yearly stipend of thirty three pounds six shillings eight pence a set of rules was drawn up by harvey and accepted by the governors which are interesting in two particulars first as showing that harvey was impressed with the necessity of limiting the relief afforded by the hospital and that he foresaw the inconvenience likely to arise from a press of what we should call outpatients and secondly that in the matter of prescribing internal remedies the chirurgians were unable to act independently of the physicians it further appears that there were lock hospitals in connection with st bartholomew's established in southwark and kingsland in the disused leper hospitals leprosy having then disappeared from london for the reception of venereal cases that venereal disease had long been very rife in london appears from the statement of william close in fifteen ninety six that within five years over a thousand cases had been cured at st bartholomew's and he adds i speak nothing of st thomas hospital and other houses about the city wherein an infinite multitude are daily cured harvey retired from st bartholomew's in sixteen forty three in harvey's time the staff consisted of two physicians three surgeons one of whom john woodhall was the author of the surgeon's mate and in his twenty-four years service amputated more than one hundred of legs and arms with a mortality of twenty per cent one surgeon for the stone two surgeons or guides for the lock hospitals an apothecary and a curer of scald heads this latter functionary appears to have been a woman and the salary paid to her for her services varied from twenty seven pounds in sixteen twenty three to a hundred and twenty six pounds in sixteen forty two and there is evidence to show that she received three or four shillings for each scald head cured according to dr church at st bartholomew's hospital where the diet owing to the munificence of dr radcliffe has since his time at least been exceptionally good so late as seventeen sixty seven potatoes do not seem to have been introduced into any of the diets greens were given on certain days of the week but no other vegetables are mentioned End of number eight. number nine of london ancient and modern this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two london from the medical point of view part six the pharmacopoeias the rise of the medical schools hospitals built by public benevolence modern medical schools and examinations london as a place of study the pharmacopoeias dr church in an article in st bartholomew's hospital reports volume twenty called our hospital pharmacopoeia gives many interesting facts the surgeons found their own drugs in fifteen forty nine and they were allowed eighteen pounds a year because things pertaining to their faculty be very dear in a note appended to an old formula in the st bartholomew's pharmacopoeia for a poultice of which cow dung was one ingredient dr church says those who have not had the curiosity to look back at the old pharmacopoeias of the london colleges of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries can hardly imagine the disgusting nature of the substances they contained in the catalogue of the official simples of our own london college for the year sixteen eighty nine occur homo vivens capelli unguis saliva cerumen sordes sudor urina stercus sanguis calculi semen lac menses secundinae homo mortuus cadaver caro cutis pinguedo ossa cranium cerebrum cor fell manus and this at a time when r morton edward tyson hans sloane and richard blackmore were fellows of our college and sydenham a licentiate it is not until the fifth edition of the pharmacopoeia of our london college that we get rid of the old traditions handed down from the earliest periods of medicine 
the seventeen forty six pharmacopoeia may be said to mark a perfect revolution or rather i should say reformation in the annals of pharmacy this purging of the pharmacopoeia of disgusting things for the most part superstitiously and dotingly derived from oracles dreams and astrological fancies was largely due to dr plumptre who was president of the college from seventeen forty to seventeen forty six and the extent of it may be gained from the fact that the simples which numbered six hundred and forty five in the fourth edition had in the fifth dwindled to two hundred and eight many of the formulae previously in use had been derived from the east and notably from a learned pharmacologist called john of damascus concerning the date of whom authorities agree to differ the complexity of some of the old formulae was prodigious the antidote of matthiolius against poisons and plague contained a hundred and thirty one ingredients and venice treacle which was largely prescribed by sydenham and even later physicians contained over sixty in the sixth seventeen eighty eight edition of the pharmacopoeia sixty-three articles which appeared in the fifth edition were discontinued among those who stayed at his post during the plague must be mentioned dr francis bernard apothecary and subsequently physician sixteen seventy eight to st bartholomew's hospital to rightly estimate his conduct we must remember that the governors of the hospital as well as the physicians had deserted it dr church gives the following extracts from the minutes of the court held at the green man near leighton in the county of essex september twenty eighth sixteen sixty five forasmuch as it was now understood that the two doctors were remiss to officiate or procure their business to be done as it ought to be it was therefore thought fit for dr bernard the apothecary whose ability is so well approved should prescribe at the present for the patients in the said doctor's stead until further orders thereon in the same court the salaries of the two doctors dr micklethwaite and dr turn were ordered not to be paid the treatment of the patients in the early days of the hospitals was occasionally a little severe thus dr steele of guise has kindly furnished me with a few extracts made from one of the old committee books of st thomas's fifteen sixty seven patients were ordered to be whipped at the cross for misdemeanour fifteen seventy three a hand-mill was ordered to grind corn to keep patients from idleness fifteen ninety eight foul patients i e venereal notoriously lewd livers were ordered when cured to be punished at the cross before being discharged this reads like great severity but severity was probably necessary in southwark which was rather a rough suburb of london thus an old map of southwark given in mr rendell's paper shows that in the year fifteen forty two there were some eighteen large inns of which the tabard or talbot was one here also in later times was paris garden bull rings bear rings the globe theatre and lastly the brothels or stews which were under the control of the bishop of winchester the denizens being known as winchester geese perhaps therefore it is not surprising that in this map are shown two sets of pillories and cages and that the governors of the hospital found strong measures to be necessary to maintain discipline the rise of the medical schools the anatomical lectures given by the barber surgeons and physicians were for a long time the only sources of practical anatomical knowledge but the want of more opportunities for dissecting began in time to be felt by the apprentices of the surgeons employed at the hospitals in the latter days of the barber surgeons company difficulties were experienced in obtaining subjects for dissection and there is evidence to show that the officials having charge of execution were bribed to let the bodies of felons pass into private hands william cheselton sixteen eighty eight to seventeen fifty two was one of the chief offenders in holding private anatomies which were contrary to the rules of the company 
cheselton was renowned as an anatomist and surgeon and did much to perfect the operation of a lateral lithotomy and must be looked upon as the real founder of the medical school of st thomas's before his time however viz in sixteen ninety five complaint was made that the surgeons of st thomas's taught surgery to other than their own apprentices and in seventeen o two the governors of st thomas's while recognizing the right of the surgeons to take pupils ordained that none shall have more than three cubs at one time nor take any for less than a year private anatomies began gradually to be more common and in seventeen seventeen we come upon a record of body snatching when the widow of william childers made complaint that her husband's corpse after its burial in the burying place at moorfields was taken up by the grave digger and sold to some surgeons which corpse was stopped at an inn in a hamper to be sent to oxford church in seventeen twenty six the anatomical museum at st bartholomew's was commenced by john freke which is strong evidence of the growth of anatomical teaching and in seventeen thirty four mention is made in the records of the dissecting room belonging to this house it was not till seventeen fifty that leave was obtained for the regular making of post-mortem examination at st bartholomew's in seventeen sixty seven an operating theatre was erected and finally in eighteen twenty two an anatomical theatre was built for john abernathy who was really the founder of the medical school of st bartholomew's hospitals built by public benevolence it was in the eighteenth century that the royal hospitals were found to be insufficient for the wants of the population and private benevolence began to supply the deficiencies of royal foundations the westminster hospital is said to have been the first hospital established by subscription viz in seventeen nineteen the present building dating from seventeen thirty two i can do little more than mention these hospitals but in doing so with their dates i would call attention to the fact that most of them were originally built in what were then the outskirts of the town just as st bartholomew's was outside the walls and st thomas's in the unimportant suburb of southwark guy's was founded in seventeen twenty two by thomas guy a bookseller and according to recent information a publisher he is said to have made his money partly by selling bibles partly by buying up sailors prize tickets and partly by successful speculation at the time of the south sea bubble be that as it may he spent over eighteen thousand pounds on the building of his hospital and endowed it with another two hundred and twenty thousand pounds st george's was founded in seventeen thirty three the london hospital in seventeen forty the lock hospital in seventeen forty six queen charlotte's lying in hospital in seventeen fifty two the smallpox hospital originally at king's cross in seventeen forty six the middlesex hospital in seventeen forty five st luke's hospital for lunatics in seventeen fifty one the ophthalmic hospital moorfields in eighteen o four charing cross hospital originating from a dispensary existing in eighteen eighteen in eighteen thirty one the royal free hospital in eighteen twenty eight university college hospital in eighteen thirty three king's college hospital in eighteen thirty nine brompton consumption hospital in eighteen forty four and st mary's hospital in eighteen fifty one the above list includes only some of the chief hospitals of london and it is impossible to overestimate the service they have done to humanity not only by relieving distress but in disseminating a knowledge of medicine and surgery in bringing this part of my address to a close i have only to mention that in seventeen forty five the surgeons finally separated from the barbers they obtained a new charter and removed to surgeons hall in the old bailey where they remained until eighteen hundred when they again removed to the present house in lincoln's inn fields and became the royal college of surgeons of england in treating of a subject like that which i have chosen it becomes necessary to adopt some plan of limitation otherwise one would talk interminably 
on this account i have resolved to give no details concerning the great london physicians and surgeons who flourished in the eighteenth and the beginning of the nineteenth centuries if therefore i say nothing of arbuthnot eikenside mead pringle smelly baker william and john hunter klein sharp percival pot abernethy sir charles bell liston brodie astley cooper john abernethy william lawrence and many others it is not from want of appreciation of their merits but merely because to do so would take me too far i purpose therefore to skip over the eighteenth and the beginning of the nineteenth century and conclude my paper with a few remarks on the teaching of medicine in modern london fifty years ago medical schools were very different from what they are now the teaching was far less thorough the examinations far less complete for example according to sir james paget st bartholomew's hospital fifty years ago it was the universal custom for students to be apprenticed in the country and to spend eighteen months in london before going up for the college and hall the examination at the college of surgeons was conducted by ten examiners who sat at a semicircular table was entirely viva voce and lasted twenty minutes the teaching for these examinations was entirely by lectures and it was no uncommon thing for one man to lecture on more than one subject thus at st bartholomew's stanley who was surgeon to the hospital lectured on anatomy and physiology and the senior physician in medicine and chemistry while of clinical instruction there was practically none the operating was swift and dexterous the mortality after it great for there was scarcely a thought about blood infections none would hesitate to go straight from a dissection of a dead body to an operation on a living one and at the first dressing of an amputation or any large wound the stench of the decomposing bloody fluid running from it was enough to infect the whole ward the nursing at that time was of a rough order the nurses were often intemperate and almost always women who morally and intellectually might fairly be classed among the lower orders modern medical schools and examinations things are very different now and it is only fair to state that this college and the university of london were undoubtedly the pioneers in that great improvement in medical education and medical examinations which has taken place during the reign of her majesty university college was established in eighteen twenty eight and within ten years of that date we find an illustrious staff of professors nearly every one of whom has had an important share in increasing our knowledge of natural science in its widest sense turner and thomas graham the latter certainly the greatest chemist of his time were teaching chemistry lindley and grant each of them preeminent in his own department of knowledge held the chairs of botany and comparative anatomy while dionysius lardner a man of great learning in whom the power of expounding and lecturing was developed to an extraordinary degree was professor of natural philosophy quain and sharpy were teaching anatomy and physiology and writing the world-famous textbook still known as quain and sharpy carswell was professor of morbid anatomy and producing the series of marvellous water-colour drawings illustrative of his subject which are and ever must be reckoned among the greatest treasures of our museum samuel cooper and liston were teaching surgery anthony todd thompson materia medica davis midwifery gordon smith medical jurisprudence while elliotson and c j b williams who but lately was the sole survivor of his then colleagues were setting an example in the teaching of medicine the effect of which is doubtless felt amongst us still here then more than fifty years ago was a medical school complete in the modern sense our teaching has been altered in its details and has tended to become more and more practical but in principle it is the same now as it was then each branch of knowledge which is necessary for a medical man is provided for and controlled by a separate professor and it is a remarkable fact and redounds greatly to the foresight and wisdom of our founders 
that the number of professorial chairs remains the same the only addition being the all-important one of public health and hygiene in the establishment of which we were again the pioneers among medical schools if imitation be the sincerest form of flattery we ought to feel proud for every school in london is now formed more or less perfectly on the model established here in eighteen twenty eight fifty years ago as sir james paget reminds us medical examinations were conducted in practically the same manner as that which is immortalized by smollett in the pages of roderick random but fifty years ago was founded the university of london an institution which lives and progresses in spite of torrents of abuse and which has had a greater effect for good upon medical education in this country than all the other universities and medical corporations put together the great merit of the university of london consists not in the severity of its examinations in which particular it is fully equalled by the corporations but in the training which it obliges each of its graduates to undergo and when the general medical council some few years since reported on the final professional examinations without reference to the two earlier examinations it showed a want of appreciation of the principles which have guided this university the university of london from the first decided that no one should become even an undergraduate who had not mastered his a b c not merely the a b c of mathematics and certain selected languages but the a b c of science also there are many who still cavil at the breadth of the matriculation and seem to forget that it comprises no subject that a decently educated man can in the present day ignore it is argued that this wide smattering of knowledge which the matriculation involves is wrong and that the best training for the mind is to master one subject thoroughly a thing which nobody in this world ever did and schoolboys of sixteen least of all the correlation of knowledge is so complete that no one can attempt to master any one branch without some knowledge of many other branches and in this fact is found the justification for the first examination which a medical student has to undergo which of the subjects of the matriculation is unnecessary for a decently educated doctor the preliminary scientific examination is the most abused of all but in making a knowledge of natural philosophy chemistry and biology precede the study of anatomy and physiology the university of london is undoubtedly right and there are signs that the other examining bodies are coming round to the same opinion of the final examination i need say nothing there are those who say even eminent persons and notably one aberdeen graduate that the effect of the university of london has not been good and that the medical graduates are not practical men this assertion is too ridiculous to require an answer for it is notorious that the london medical graduates have had more than their fair share and in the practical advances made by medicine in the last half century and in medicine surgery midwifery and public health they have more than held their own it is very possible that a scientific training makes it rather difficult for a conscientious man to be dogmatic and until the public is more highly educated than at present the dogmatic practitioner is sure to have a large clientele and will pass for a practical man scientific medicine has made enormous advances but for a knowledge of the little arts not always honest arts which tend to increase our gains john of ardern was quite equal to any practitioner of the present day he was in one sense preeminently a practical man but whether we should do well to imitate him is more than doubtful london as a place of study there can be no doubt that as a place to study medicine london is because of its enormous population unrivalled in the year eighteen eighty seven according to the hospital there were treated at the london hospitals and dispensaries seventy nine thousand two hundred and sixty one inpatients 
and one million one hundred and eighty thousand two hundred and fifty one outpatients or a total of over one million and a quarter exclusive of those who received relief at the workhouse infirmaries sick asylums and lunatic asylums it is true that a considerable portion of these patients are not so readily available for the student as they might be the following are the numbers of patients according to the hospital treated at the hospitals attached to the medical schools in eighteen eighty seven readers note here follows a large table this gives a total of one thousand three hundred and eighty six different patients for every day throughout the year it is certain that no city in the world offers a field for medical study in any way equal to that of london i think it is much to be regretted that for qualified men a composition ticket admitting freely to the practice of all the hospitals in london is not arranged for if such a ticket were issued and qualified men anxious to prolong their studies might in return for a payment feel themselves free to visit any or all of the great london hospitals there can be no doubt that we should have a great afflux of students i very much doubt the wisdom of the policy of trying to attract numbers of students by lowering the examination tests for a degree this is an educational age and we must not forget that some of the boys at the board schools have possibly a juster knowledge of physiology than had many of our professional ancestors science is being taught to all more and more every day the druggist is now a highly educated man and nurses are being drawn more and more from the educated classes if the medical profession is to hold its own and to grow in popular esteem it must be chary about lowering its educational standards at a time when the education of all classes is advancing end of number nine end of london ancient and modern by george vivian poor